So, so far we've talked about graphs that can be drawn without crossings on a plane. And we've seen that being possible to draw on a plane is the same as being drawable without crossings on a sphere, because you can project the plane to the sphere and the sphere you can puncture or stereographically project to a plane. So, okay, now we know what uh, we need to know should we ever want to draw graphs on spheres. But why spheres in particular? What about other surfaces? What if you want to draw a graph on a torus? Like this donut shaped surface. Or maybe stranger still, the double torus. I have yet to see donuts fabricated in this shape, but that would be amazing or other kinds of surfaces in general. So we will now take a look at graphs that are drawable on such other surfaces and what we can say about them. So first of all, how, what can a surface actually look like? Well, there is a fact from topology. Topology is the study of shapes in mathematics. So you don't worry so much about exact areas and lengths. It's not like uh, geometry. Topology is just worrying about the shape of things. And topology tells you that any reasonable surface is essentially a sphere with some number of handles on it. So for those of you who are interested in uh, topology, let me be precise. By reasonable surface, I mean uh, closed, bounded, and orientable, whatever that means. Uh, if you know, you know. If you don't know, it's not important. It just means reasonable. Um, if by continuously deformable, I mean that your surface might not come to you as a sphere with a handle, but by just pushing in and pushing out and drawing uh, around, you get it to be uh, a sphere with a number of handles. In topology, this is called homeomorphic, same word as for homeomorphic graphs, and there is a deeper link to that, but unfortunately we have no time to go into this. Uh, you might have heard this famous thing that a donut is the same thing as a coffee mug to the topologist. This is just saying that you can deform a coffee mug continuously to a donut. There are great illustrations of that online. But let's get back to our world. So now, we, are only, we, do, we only have to care about spheres with handles. This, by the way, is quite a powerful fact. I mean, it's, it's hard to prove. And uh, it's, it's remarkable because you would imagine there are millions of different kinds of surfaces, but in fact, no. So this is what a sphere with a handle looks like. So it's like a kettlebell, if you will. And then you can have two handles. And actually, so before I drew this double torus, and the double torus has two holes and it's deformable to this sphere with two handles. You sort of blow up this middle part till it's spherical and then you'll get a sphere with two handles. So now we want to draw our graphs on spheres with a certain number of handles. By the way, the number of handles is called the genus of the surface. So if you can draw a graph without crossings on a surface of genus G, you can certainly draw it on graphs with, on spheres with higher, with, on surfaces with higher genus. I mean, if you can draw uh, your graph without crossings on a surface with seven handles, then placing an eighth handle, just make sure to draw your graph so that the face of the graph encompasses this eighth handle, this will be possible too. Uh, but if you take away handles, maybe things will not work anymore. So a graph is said to be of genus G, if it can be drawn without crossing, on a surface of genus G, but not on a surface of lower genus. We will see an example in a moment. 
So this is known as the genus of the graph and it's denoted G of G. So it's the smallest number of handles such that you can draw the graph without crossing edges on a sphere with this many handles. So since a graph is planar if and only if it can be drawn on a sphere without any handles, the number of handles we need is zero, so the genus of the graph uh, is zero. This is another way of characterizing planarity. The genus of K5 is one. Why is that? Well, again, I will bother you with my famous drawing of K5, where we have this cycle. These edges go inside. These edges go outside. Now imagine I'm drawing this not on a plane, but on the surface of the Earth, on, on a sphere. Then I, if I want to draw this extra edge, I can't. What ideally I would want to do is to just lift this edge up over my other edge. And that is precisely what a handle is good for. So if I can just insert a handle here, that's awesome because then this extra edge can go on this handle and I will not have any crossings. That is how handles help uh, with crossings. And so if you have a graph with any number of crossings, you can place handles everywhere where you have the crossings and so it will be a graph that is drawable on a surface. Uh, more precisely, you can prove that for a general graph, the genus is at most the crossing number, precisely for the reason that you can insert one handle uh, at each crossing, so you need at most the crossing number of handles. Now, there is, you shouldn't be surprised, a generalization of Euler's formula for such graphs. So remember, we had a graph being uh, planar. When a graph was planar, then n minus m plus f was equal to 2. Now, if the graph is not necessarily planar, but has genus g, then n minus m plus f is 2 minus 2g. So remember, we said that planar was the same as the genus equal to zero, and then we get n minus m plus f is equal to two. So the proof of this generalization is, uh, if you want to do it precisely outside the scope of this course, I will give you an idea of the proof. So this proof is characteristic of proofs that have anything to do with topology. It can be done very precisely, but you get the idea the best if you just are a bit hand-waving and try to get in a geometric intuition. So many of these claims will seem to be not really substantiated, but that's okay. I'm just trying to give you an idea, not a proof that you will need to uh, see in every detail. So if you have this graph with genus G, then draw it on a sphere with G handles. So let me illustrate how this is going to look. So I have this uh, sphere, this sphere with a handle. <clears throat> and well, maybe actually let's draw the handle closer to here. So then if I have my graph, the claim is that the graph will have a cycle around every uh, and so on. It will have a cycle around every edge connection. Why is that? Well, if it didn't, th then I mean, the, the graph will have to also go so will go something like that. If it didn't, then I could do without the handle. If my graph did not uh, have a cycle around every edge connection, I could have easily 
uh, done without this handle. But since the genus is G, I am claiming that the graph is not drawable with fewer handles. So I will have a cycle around each handle connection. So what do you do? Take your graph and tighten the cycles so that it goes exactly around the meeting of the handle and the sphere. This doesn't change anything graph theoretically, it just uh, simplifies the geometric picture. So now I have my sphere with a bunch of handles and exactly where each handle meets my sphere, I will have a graph. If you can see, it's gonna look a bit like this. So I have a cycle around every meeting of handle with sphere. So now what do I do? I break the handle apart. So exactly as I showed you, this is my broken handle. This handle used to go all the way, but now I broke it off from the sphere. So now what do I have? I have a hole here and I copy the cycle that surrounds the hole onto the end of the handle. So let me draw this insofar as I can draw. So we have our sphere. And now I have this broken handle that just goes out into space. And here is this other hole. And around the hole I had my cycle. And I copy this cycle around here. So it used to be one cycle, but now I have two copies of it. Uh, and this changes the number of uh, edges and uh, vertices. But since I'm adding a cycle, and a cycle has just as many edges and vertices as vertices, I am adding exactly as many edges as vertices, so the n minus m plus f doesn't change because I didn't change the number of faces. That's also a bit tricky to see why I'm not changing the number of faces, but let's leave it at that. So once I have done that, I am in this position with my broken hole and my handle sticking out of the sphere. Now I pull the handle back into the sphere. I sort of shrink the handle. That is a continuous deformation. And when I do that, I end up with another hole here. The, this is the outside cycle is the cycle I had from the beginning. And now the retraction of my handle gives me this inner cycle where there is a hole. So this whole process of eliminating one handle gave me a circle, uh, sorry, a sphere with two holes in it. So if I do this with every handle, I will get two holes for every handle that I remove because every handle connects at two places. Since I have G handles, I will have two times G holes. So the situation is now when I have done this and copied the uh, cycles and, and so on and disconnected everything, uh, I am getting a, a sphere, a graph that is drawable on a sphere with this many holes. And so the number of uh, edges minus uh, m plus f is not going to be 2 because now instead of faces, I have holes. Remember, since each cycle is exactly surrounding a hole, I am losing a face for each hole. So since I have 2g holes, the number of faces is going to be 2g less than on a sphere without holes. And therefore, n minus m plus f is equal to 2 minus 2g. This is the idea to prove the theorem. Of course, there was a lot of hand waving and balloons and handles and so on, but I hope that it gives a picture on how you prove such a thing. If you're interested, you can definitely think about taking more courses in topology where you see lots of stuff like that, but also other interesting stuff. We will stop here.